Hi, I'm Martin Pritikin, the Dean of Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, the nation's first fully online law school. Welcome to this latest installment of our Distinguished Speaker webinar series on the topic of freedom of expression online, the internet, social media, and algorithms. Now our webinar was scheduled for today because May 1st is the American Bar Association's annual Law Day, which is designed to raise awareness of and interest in the importance of law. The theme of this year's Law Day is free speech, free press, free society. And our topic obviously fits perfectly with that theme. We're very fortunate today to have not just one, but two distinguished guests to discuss this topic. First, Professor Chinmayi Arun is a visiting fellow of the Burton Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She's an assistant professor of law at National Law University in Delhi, India, and is the founding director of their Center for Communication Governance. She has served on a number of national and international commissions and advisory groups, including for the United Nations. Among the publications she has authored are Freedom House's Freedom on the Net, National Report on India, and the Global Network for Center Study of Online Intermediaries. Our other guest, Cindy Cohen, is the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a well-known advocacy organization. She has litigated a number of key cases before the United States Supreme Court, among other courts, and her cases have dealt with some of the most pressing and timely issues of the day, like US export restrictions on cryptography, electronic voting machines, and Google's efforts to digitize all of human literature. She has sponsored legislation on privacy and related topics as well. Her articles have appeared in the Yale Law Journal and various other prestigious publications. Not surprisingly, she's repeatedly appeared on lists of most influential lawyers in America. So Chidmai and Cindy, thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start off, I think it's important to lay the background, right? Because we're talking about free speech online, which raises a, a, a threshold question. What makes the issue of free speech online particularly unique or particularly important? Um, I think it's important for people to get both the legal landscape and even just what's the issue. Um, Shimai, do you want to start by sort of laying out some of the basic background about the issue of free speech online? Um, yes, it, so it used to be treated at least as a, as a relatively simple question of we need to maximize free speech, but that, that's a very old debate. Now, as everyone knows, it's become complicated because uh, free speech online has to be mediated with concerns of hate speech. Uh, we've seen the violence in Sri Lanka, the Christchurch attack, the ways in which extremist speech is, is permeating online. Uh, there's disinformation in the context of elections. And so now what we have is this important value of free speech online, which is attention with harmful speech online. Um, and, and the question is that how do you deal with legitimate questions of harmful speech without over-censoring free speech online? And what we're seeing at the moment is not promising, but um, I'll, I'll stop here and, and leave that for further discussion. Okay, fair enough. Um, Cindy, uh, what is sort of the, the legal background? Is there current uh, prevailing law on this issue about um, online uh, liability for or ability to regulate um, speech? Sure, I mean, um, to, to start from the beginning, uh, one of the, in the late 1990s, the Supreme Court of the United States recognized that the internet was a place of free speech. Um, and, and honestly, that's why I'm interested in, uh, and lots of people are interested, you know, the internet, provided an opportunity for people to be able to speak to the world without having to own a newspaper or have the kinds of resources that used to be necessary. Um, and they can not only speak to the whole world, they can speak to somebody on the other side of the world with no friction um, really easily. So the promise of the internet was it was, it, to me, is that it was going to let everybody have a voice and especially the voiceless, especially the people who, you know, under whether you're talking about television or radio or newspapers, um, that's a very, very small number of people who actually get to have their voice heard. And the internet really democratized that. Um, so that's the kind of starting thing. And this is what the Supreme Court recognized in the late 1990s in a case called ACLU versus Reno. Um, the other thing that makes the internet very different than other fora is that it is almost entirely, well, at least the, the key places where people speak online are not the public square, they're actually owned by private companies. 
Um, so whether you're speaking on Facebook or you've got a blog, um, you know, that's hosted by somebody, there are private entities that facilitate the speech of ordinary people. And that um, is, is a pretty uh, significant thing. And one of the things that Congress did also in the 1990s was recognize that you we weren't going to build a place where everyone could speak if the private entities uh, who hosted people's speak, speech were responsible for what everybody said. Nobody would host a public forum if you were held liable for anybody who said something wrong on that public forum. And uh, there's a law that, that commonly called CDA Section 230 that makes sure that when you're speaking online, you're responsible for your own words but the people who host your speech are not, except in some, uh, in, in general civil consequences. They can still be responsible for criminal liability. Uh, there's still a, a process they have to navigate to not be responsible under copyright law. Um, but for the vast majority of what people say online, uh, their hosts are, the people who host their speech are not responsible for them. And that's tremendously important piece of the puzzle if we're going to let if we're going to have a, a democratized um, medium. Um, so right now, you know, there are lots of questions given the, you know, kind of some of the problems we've seen with speech online about this structure and what pieces of it are working and what pieces of it aren't working. Um, and, you know, for me, that's, um, can be very um, nervous making because there, you know, there's baby in that bathwater. Right, right. And the CDA 230 referring to is Communications Decency Act, Section 230, um, which was a big deal, right, because there was this really open question about whether uh, online entities would be liable if they had any role in moderating or, you know, um, monkeying with <clears throat> the speech. So one of the other interesting things, of course, is that the CDA 230 was passed by the U.S. Congress. But one of the other really interesting things about the Internet, right, is that it doesn't recognize borders, doesn't recognize political or, you know, geographical limitations. Um, so, Chimayi, you know, since you're based in another country, in another continent, um, how should we be thinking about these cross-border issues? Obviously, it's a huge topic, but just, again, sort of laying the groundwork for some of the issues. So, so uh, CDA 230 had an interesting impact around the world. Um, when, when the platforms began and they were, they were operating at a smaller scale, there's, the speech on the platforms was visible and we were all using them around the world, but they didn't have offices and their market penetration in the rest of the world was limited. As they grew and as more of us got online and our, our conversations um, started taking place in the public for uh, that, that are the platforms, as, as Cindy described, this, it was interesting because they started having an impact on our laws around the world. So we now have similar protections for platforms in multiple jurisdictions around the world, including India. But the thing is that where each country draws the line for what it considers harmful speech and what, what is uh, freedom, of, freedom of expression, that's different. And so what we have now is a situation in which different countries tell platforms that they want certain kinds of speech regulated. And, and that can happen either through a government saying it in, you know, in, in a government notice or through a court order to a platform. And sometimes it can happen through informal channels where a government just tells a platform that we don't want to see this content online. It shouldn't be there in the first place. We're not asking you to take it, take it down. And it's leading to this interesting consequence because I, I tell people that, the, that if you think in terms of brute force attacks on platforms, what governments do with them is in, sometimes they just block them entirely from the country. Sometimes they shut them down for several days together. And other times it's kind of, it's a softer pressure, which in some ways is more dangerous because nobody knows what's going on. So for example, if you see the interplay between the Indian government and WhatsApp, you will see a number of news articles that report that the Indian government is asking WhatsApp to do a series of things, including taking responsibility for the harmful speech that is causing the lynchings, uh, but also sharing data that would enable the government to track people because they're sharing harmful speech, but who knows how it might be used beyond that. And so, so this, uh, the way in which platforms engage across the world, it's really interesting because the citizens of of these countries don't have access to the law that primarily affects the platforms, which would be US law. 
we have our own constitutional rights at home, but that that depends a little bit on how far they can be enforced as far as the platforms are concerned. So again, if you look at India, if you if you consider an Indian activist in Kashmir uh, versus the Indian government that feels that a lot of the activists that would categorize a lot of the, the activist speech as as extremist content. And then you look at the platforms that are mediating the speech and consider who they're going to listen to. Is it, is it the government that is in control of their markets or is it the activist who in our, in our idea of what international human rights and freedom of expression should mean, should ideally be allowed to speak because the activist is a vulnerable person with actually almost no other place to speak in. And then obviously highlighting the, uh, the importance right, societally, politically um, of these issues. Um, Cindy, I want to go back for a minute for something you emphasized before the idea that it's private companies that are really moderating this speech. And, you know, the reason that's important is that at least according to U.S. First Amendment doctrine, it's generally the government, not private actors, right, that are subject to the First Amendment. Um, generally, the court has held that there needs to be state action in order for an entity to be uh, liable to the First Amendment. And it has happened that private actors uh, have been held to be engaged in state action, right? The famous company town uh, case. Um, now, as the executive director of EFF, I assume you're generally in favor of more speech, less censorship. Do you believe that these internet companies, you know, Twitter, Facebook, should they be held to be state actors because of the prominence of their role or do you not go that far? Oh, I don't even go close to that. I think that there are lots of ways to think about how to make the companies more uh, responsible in what they're doing. But pretending that they're companies um, is, I think, very dangerous. Uh, first of all, we can't we can't get rid of them, right? Like the, the whole electoral process that that is supposed to be a check on whether uh, somebody has gone too far doesn't apply to companies. And so treating them like governmental entities, I think it just creates some real issues around what, you know, what I actually would like to see happen is there to be more of them, to be competition among the companies, to have, you know, uh, to me, if you've got a problem that you've got a powerful uh, monopolist or dictator, the answer isn't to make that dictator nicer. It's to get rid of them or to, to shrink them back down to size. And so for me, the, the best thing, the, one of the, the, the areas that we're really beginning to focus on at EFF is how do we create more competition in these spaces so that the companies have an incentive to move towards privacy protection, to move towards creating uh, more control and end users. I think the second thing that we talk about a lot is how do we push control of what's going on on these networks out to the end users and get the companies, even if they're big and powerful, out of the middle of this. And, and this is where the algorithms really come into play, right? I mean, we the internet used to be kind of a choose your own adventure kind of place where you got to pick where you wanted to go. You know, there, were, there wasn't a lot of um, technologies that were essentially trying to feed you information by figuring out what you might want to see or what's going to keep you on the platform longer. And all of these technologies, um, I just don't think should get a pass as we're thinking about what we want to do to encourage free speech. They're a tremendous driver of um, consolidation. They're a tremendous driver. We know, especially in the context of YouTube, but other things as well, they're a tremendous driver of extremism. Um, feeding people more and more extreme ideas. Um, I, I, I think that the, the, for me, the right path to think about how to get out of this position is to reduce the power of these companies, not increase the power of these companies, but creating governmental, creating, making them like governments to me points in the wrong direction. Well, so I have to ask at least two follow-up questions and Chinmay, you feel free to, to jump in as well. So first of all, um, I mean, as much economics as law or anything else, but how do you create more competition when, of course, one of the primary benefits of these platforms is that they are ubiquitous, right? You don't want to go onto a networking platform that doesn't have a very big network, right? These, these, these entities rely on network effects. So is there any practical way to increase competition or is the natural, inevitable uh, trend in this area just more consolidation, more monopolization? It's true. We're all stuck here in MySpace. 
I mean, honestly, All right, Facebook, say. like Moses did not come down off of a mountain with Facebook, right? Like this is a company that is not very old um, and its dominant position is less than a decade old. Um, Google, a couple more longer. Well, well, I'm just saying that, like, I think there is a little bit of amnesia going on around. I think network of the idea of network effects is real and I'm not saying it's not real, but I just feel like it's been it's been lifted as if it is a law of nature as opposed to a thing that one could build systems and strategize around. It's absolutely, you know, Facebook didn't, wasn't the dominant player when it started. Um, there's a pretty good story to tell about how Facebook started by promoting itself as more privacy protective and just your friends. And it was only after it squashed all of its competition that it turned into this, uh, the kind of behemoth it is today. Um, I think it's possible to think about how one could use law and policy and competition and support for co competitors to create a, you know, a market of, of choices for people. Um, one of the other pieces that, that is really important for this is um, kind of a wonky, it feels like a wonky technical thing, but it's interoperability, right? It's, it's the, you know, Facebook used to be very interoperable. You, you know, Facebook got everybody's contact information because it made it really easy for you to upload your contact list from Google. And then, you know, that was how they, but, but, you know, and now they shut the door, right? Nobody else could go to Facebook and have you port over very easily your information into another thing. That's not a technical issue. That's a policy, law, business model issue. And, and uh, the technology, we could build a technology that lets you very easily move from Facebook to somewhere else. Um, it takes some work and it would take Facebook's cooperation. It's hard to do it while pounding on the door outside. But, you know, we mandated that the, the telephone companies had to let people plug different things into the wall. And AT&T said, no, our, our network cannot possibly, this is the Carter phone decision uh, the, in the FCC that in, you know, years ago. But, you know, AT&T said our network is, you know, completely, you know, freestanding. There's no possible way you could plug anything other than our phones into it and have the network work. And you know what? Turns out that wasn't true. And it's not true about Facebook either. If we have the right policy and will to to to, to really kind of take on the anti-competitive pieces, um, now that's just Facebook. There's a different story for the different companies. Right. But I think once you start thinking about how to actually foster competition in this area, uh, EFF is very involved in something called the decentralized web movement. Uh, the Internet Archive is spearing, spearheading this. Um, there are a lot of people, and honestly, I think there's business opportunities there, right? You know, the Silicon Valley, you know, and this is a law class, but, you know, I think Silicon Valley is kind of stagnating because there is a sense among the people who fund projects that you just poss can't possibly compete with Facebook. You can't compete with Google. You can't compete with Microsoft or Amazon. And I think that that is really ripe for someone with a better idea and better opportunity to come in and prove them wrong because, They've been proven wrong over and over again. Every new company that comes along, there's a whole lot of people who said it can't be done. Um, right. So, so I, I, that's kind of the way I begin to think of it, and and it, it puts me in a very different position than people who really want to create a lot of regulation, uh, a lot of limits on what Facebook can do that are about censoring more or making sure that bad speech doesn't stay up or you know kind of putting those kind of burdens on the company um i'm not completely opposed to some of those things but i i, I guess i think that that is a short-term make the dictator better strategy and what we need is a long-term no dictator strategy okay fair enough um yeah. Kimai, do you want to weigh I, in I, I couldn't agree more. I, I I think that the social capital problem that you're pointing to, Marty, it, it is an existing one, but as Cindy says, it is very much a problem created by markets and there is no reason for governments to allow it. So for example, I can't go, go, go off WhatsApp because teaching my grandparents how to use another like Signal or something would be impossible. <laughs> but if I could talk to them on WhatsApp while I'm on Signal, then I could go off WhatsApp. Um, and we need rules that enable that. And Cindy's exactly right that once once we insist that that interoperability has to ha has to has to be put in place, it will be put in place. We're able to talk across telecom operators all the time, right? Um, so there's there's no reason to build it in for for content companies. 
But I, I would do this with a twist. I agree that we shouldn't give the companies more power and certainly not the power to make the more fine decisions about speech. That is not their function. But I, uh, speaking, from some, uh, speaking as someone that lives in countries that sometimes give the companies incentives to over-censor, I do wish that there was a way to obligate the companies not to agree to censor beyond a point. Yeah. At, least to, at least as far as they wield the kind of power that they wield, which they do right now, right. It, would be, it would be good if they were not able to take speech down at will or share data pretty much at will. Yeah, I have a, I really strongly agree. And I think that your point that like, you know, you can focus only on direct governmental kind of censorship, the kind of core First Amendment thing. Um, and there's plenty to do there. Uh, or, um, but the more insidious problem that I think we're facing right now is that these big companies are feeling uh, the pressure um, or the incentive to censor more uh, without the kind of legal requirements, because you know, based on a phone call, based on a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, based on a, their own, you know, the, these kinds of uh, informal processes. And they started in copyright law, and now they're sliding over into other situations where there are these. In for, informal agreements for the companies to engage in censorship. And they're, they're much less transparent. There's much less accountability. It's harder for us to figure it out. EFF has a, a big process every year where you know we uh, try to encourage companies to issue transparency reports about the speech that they take down. We've got a new one coming out at the end of the month that's about terms of service violations called Tossed Out. Um, and getting our hands on the information about what's happening in these more informal processes is very, very hard and it needs, we need to shine a light there because that's where a lot of censorship is happening. So uh, a couple of things, actually, audience members are, are weighing in. So one, which I think is a tongue in cheek uh, reference to the market power, right? I mean, we're broadcasting this on Facebook Live. So I'm gonna ask, shouldn't we be presenting this on LinkedIn instead? All right, fair point, right? Um, well, I'm not sure that jumping from Facebook to Microsoft is actually a blow in <laughs> man. But if you wanted to run it on it. Jitsi or one of the open source distributed systems, that would be a really nice thing to do. Right. Um, but I think, you know, look, the I, I just want to say something because I hear this all the time. And I, I just think it's really important to recognize that while individual choice is a, it can be a very powerful thing, these are not systems, these are not problems we can solve through individual choice and through beating up people on their individual choices. The best thing for people to do who are concerned about this is to join with other people to help create the kind of pressure on policymakers, legal makers that actually make policy and legal change um, rather than kind of uh, thinking that a series of individual choices all by themselves can solve these problems. They're, they're bigger than that. So do you think that um, governments should mandate portability across platforms, almost like a form of technological antitrust? Do you support that type of regulation? I think you'd have to be really careful, but yeah, I actually think that if you were careful about it in the same way the Carter phone decision made the, the telephone companies have to open up their networks you could see a regulatory process that did this. And I, I say that very hesitantly because, you know, historically regulators have not had a very good handle on this, the subtleties of the internet. Uh, right now, the FCC is largely responsible for the fact that we have a duopoly and no competition in broadband. So mm -hmm. I'm nervous about those people, <laughs> um, honestly, that the, you know, that cap, you know, we know agencies get captured. We have a captured FCC right now. It's just painfully obvious under edgy pie that the, you know, that he believes the role of the FCC is to do the bidding of a, of AT&T and Verizon and not the bidding of the rest of us. So you can go really wrong, uh, in, in granting, uh, agencies, uh, that kind of power. But I do think thinking about how to mandate interoperability or how to protect interoperability, you know, in copyright law, we have a reverse engineering exception to copyright liability. It needs to get bigger. Um, but you could imagine uh, some kind of a reverse engineering exception or protections against the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or other other ways to take that might not be an affirmative mandate, although I, I, I do think a, a narrow affirmative mandate might be OK. But at a minimum, take out the obstacles to interoperability that the law presents right now. Um, Shinmai, 
do you know, have any other governments, uh, India or elsewhere, addressed these issues about interoperability or done anything to promote um, ease of transferability? Or has it all been in the direction of more control, more consolidation, more censorship? No, I, so so I think from the perspective of governments around the rest of the world, it's, it, 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 to their minds, it's domestic companies versus international, right? So it's ironic because the the sort of the the monopolist models that we've been dealing with internationally are models that are being replicated in in India. You have Reliance Geo, which is huge, which is kind of becoming the next AT and T, very close to government using a lot of American models to kind of capture the market. Uh, but they're not being challenged because the way in which Indian policymakers and industrialists will talk about it is they'll be, well, it's our indigenous capitalism versus like, you know, all of our data going to an American company. And, and that's not a constructive conversation because it's not putting citizens and consumers at the center. Well, so let me ask a question of both of you. Either you can jump in first, but, you know, you, you alluded to this idea of people should be able to um, choose and it would create a, a marketplace for for policies, a marketplace for uh, lack of censorship. And I guess my, my fundamental question is, why would why should we think that a marketplace would necessarily result in less censorship? I mean, after all, isn't it the case that a lot of people were, were clamoring for Facebook, for example, to do more to censor white supremacists and white nationalist uh, posts or accounts, and in fact, criticized Facebook for not doing more sooner. So how do we know that more choice will result in, in less censorship and more speech? Well, I don't think that we do for sure, but, but one of the problems we have right now is that Facebook is not being credited for censoring well. They're being credited for censoring more. Right. So both Twitter and Facebook are coming out with, you know, look at how many thousands of posts we took down. Right. The the, the difference between, you know, they're, they're you know, they, the companies are within their rights to decide what speech they want to host and what speech they don't want to host. And, and I would never say that that isn't within their rights. But right now, the pressure that they're they're feeling and the way that they're reacting is just to take down as much as possible. Um, and I do think that, you know, if they're, while at the same time, having these algorithms that are feeding us more and more things, like there's a, it's weird, there's kind of both things going on in a way that is pretty broken, I think. Um, so, you know, the, the, the idea is that, that I don't think users are very happy with this experience. Um, I think, you know, I kind of have been joking that Facebook doesn't have customers anymore, they have hostages. Um, that, that, that if you give people other choices and you give them the ability to build their own communities, um, they're going to make different choices. And some of them might not be better, but some of them probably will be. Um, and, and, and the, you know, I think that, that, you know, markets are how we give people choices and let them exercise their own agency about the world they want to live in. And I don't think the internet's different than the real world in this regard, that if you give people choices about the world they want to live in with some, you know, solid outer boundaries, they're going to, they're going to choose, um, they're going to choose a, a more humane world. I mean, I, I see this as, as a bit of a chicken and egg question, really, uh, because we started with a world in which platforms could not moderate the way they do right now. And then they chose to get into the business of moderation. And so I see the argument less as we are asking Facebook to censor and more as Facebook was censoring already. Mm -hmm. And the quibbling has been over what Facebook censors. And so white supremacy, for example, I remember over a year back arguing with a bunch of people saying that how, how do you treat race as a neutral category? Race is not devoid of power. You can't say that that abusing black people is the same as abusing white people. It's just not, you know, and, and misogyny is a thing. It's, it, you know, sort of saying smash the patriarchy is not the same as misogyny. I, Facebook took a little bit of time to get there. And I, I think that that's different from asking Facebook to censor more. It's, it's Cindy was saying, it's asking Facebook to censor better if they're going to. So that's one. Two is that I think that all of these questions, as, as Cindy pointed out, they are interlinked. And so as long as you have this closed universe and, and algorithms that serve up more engagement and that are vulnerable to manipulation, as well as like the whole world on 
specific platforms. I think it's inevitable that when harmful speech um, that incites violence is circulating, people are going to say that, okay, can you please not facilitate incitement to genocide? But the moment it's more disaggregated, it's not a captured audience, the algorithms don't work in exactly this way. I can imagine that the platforms might take less heat. I'm very sure that those who incite violence will be creative and will come up with new ways, but you know, we would deal with that in different ways. We wouldn't be sticking to just one company. Well, yeah, I also really, think that one, uh, I'm just one, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do think that one of the things that's happening in our society right now is that um, people are trying to solve for the technological thing as opposed to solving for the hate. And, you know, uh, I, I think that there is a real risk there that, you know, like figuring out why people are, why, why this, these ideas are so powerful and so, um, being embraced by more people. I think it's been very surprising for the rest of us to do this. But I think to, you know, if you don't solve for the hate, the hater is going to find another place. The technology will always be able to be manipulated. You cannot build technology that lets people speak, but only lets them speak things that, you know, a uh, broader society wants to hear. I mean, you could do that. That's called broadcast television. Um, <laughs> Except that when the bad guys get a hold of broadcast television, it can be very, very dangerous, as people learned in the Congo or in Rwanda and other places. But I, I'm just, I, I think that 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 um, that not addressing the underlying hate and instead putting all of your attention on this dream that the technology will somehow protect people from those ideas um, it, it is problematic. And, and I think it's going to be very disappointing to people that you can't tech your way out of hate. You, you really have to address the underlying um, hate because it's going to find a way no matter what technology is used. And, and we know this, of course, we know this. We know that so many of these ideas that people are very uh, concerned about that are happening on Facebook came out of, you know, certain television stations and radio stations, you know, before they, before, you know, when, when Mark Zuckerberg wasn't even yet in his dorm room. So um, it's, it's, it's important to not let the tech kind of um, overpower the conversation. Not that it doesn't have a role, but I feel like because it's new and because people are feeling powerless and they've got, you know, uh, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who certainly is not at all a sympathetic person, it's easy to try to put all of this on his shoulders. And, um, and as much as, you know, like, I don't care about, you know, Mark's shoulders, I, I'm not sure it's the right thing for society. Well, but is that um, unfairly presenting it as an either or, right? I mean, obviously, we should be doing a variety of things to try and combat the underlying hate. But, you know, there's, a, a, I think, a legitimate argument that the world is different, right, in a fundamental way that these technologies do allow hate speech to proliferate at, at a speed and an extent that was never before possible. And just like in so many other aspects, right, there's a tension between security and liberty, right? I mean, right after 9-11, the American public, I think, was very much more in favor than uh, for the security side of things than they were on September 10th, right? Um, yeah, so but I, 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 I think now, I'm sorry, I'll let you finish, I'm sorry. No, but so, I mean, basically the wind up or the, the punchline of my question, right, is maybe it's the case that because these technologies, which don't seem to be going away, right, they're just gonna get more and more powerful, right? Because these technologies do allow hate speech and other dangerous speech to proliferate in ways that just weren't technologically possible before, maybe technology should be, if not the, but a primary focus, right? And maybe uh, the idea is we're gonna have to accept um, in order to get a higher level of security, um, just less speech overall. In order to cut out the hate speech, we're gonna be censoring more and, and maybe that is the right trade-off. If I'm I can come in. But I wanna, I'm gonna provoke you a little bit. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Go ahead, Shemaya, and then I'll take it on too. Sorry, I'm just, yeah, I'm sticking. My, so my, my last long piece was uh, beginning with this question, right? I started writing it convinced that WhatsApp must have the answer to the lynchings in India. But, you know, I read about it. I read about how rumor lynchings um, and how, how this has been going on for so many years right, in, in our country. And I finally got to... It, as Cindy was saying, that, that this has existed, it has to do with other social dynamics, a sense of insecurity that people feel, that's what you're alluding to, Marty, in, ter in terms of uh, what they're willing to see, what they're not, how they react, how much they trust outsiders. Um, and so what I got in the end was that, there, that hate, hate has to do with a lot of other factors. 
but the media can play a role in amplifying hate. And, and we need to be clear that, that, that while that is a significant role, that is the degree to which uh, technology plays a role. So for me, what, what I came to in the end with what's happened at Lynchings in India is that they are taking place even with no WhatsApp involved. You would have to do a pretty detailed study to understand to what extent there was more violence because of WhatsApp. It's not unheard of. Um, I believe it was uh, the Rwanda tribunal that, that actually came down on the media saying that, that the radio played a role in, in amplifying the hate speech. And so I, I guess that that gap of how far the technology amplifies speech, that is important. We need to understand it better. But I wouldn't bring it back to saying that it's Mark's responsibility to uh, to shut down the hate altogether because as Cindy is saying, Mark does not have that power. Maybe what he can do is be a little more thoughtful about what um, what is amplified. So for example, one of the things that I've been playing with, and I, I don't know if it's possible, right? Their algorithms track content that is going viral. They track where speech is and they've got news on their platform. Can it be that difficult to work out a way to triangulate and, and have an early warning mechanism for when something is going viral? You take a look at it. And I, I know from Kate Klonick's piece in the New Yorker recently that they're beginning to do that. Uh, but but these are systems that I, I think that need to be discussed more openly with experts. I can understand why they wouldn't want to give extremists, extremists insight into how they work. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I, I think that is really um, right on. And, um, you know, I, I think that the um, September 11th, um, story is one that is very much worth revisiting, right? I mean, there was a story after September 11th that in order to have more security, we needed to give up some of our rights. Well, it's been 18 years. How have we done? Like, I, I really, I'm really trying to be evidence-based about this. And I, I don't think that the, the scaling back on anybody's rights has made us safer. I don't think you can point to any thing that we have done that scales back people's speech rights that you can show any demonstrable security that has come from it. I would say, I, 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 I haven't seen it. And, 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 you know, so I think that there were a lot of people who, um, who had a pre-existing idea of how they'd like to see the world be, many of them uh, government contractors who made a ton of money, um, selling this idea that we need to trade off our liberties for security. But I, I don't think that the case has been made that 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 in the case of speech, I mean, there may be, you know, uh, reinforcing cockpit doors. There are things that we have done that uh, I think have a demonstrable impact on security. Um, but I don't think any of the speech related ones uh, have uh, proven themselves as having made us more secure. And so I think we should be very careful not to accept that argument without evidence, because you know, we have a, you know, the American constitution doesn't have a national security exception in it. We've been through wars. We've been through things. I mean, uh, you know, September 11th attack, I do not mean to minimize it, but it is not the size and scope of World War One, World War Two, or the Civil War in terms of the amount of death and destruction that this country took as a result of it. And we did not create a national security exception to the Constitution from the Revolutionary War forward. And, you know, I think that we didn't do that because we think that there's, I think that the reason we didn't do that is that we think that these principles about free speech and, and a functioning democracy are so important that cutting back on them for the promise or the illusion of more security is something that the founding fathers didn't choose to do. And I don't think we should choose to do now either. Um, and if we were going to do it, I would want to see something more than um, that's how some people feel. Right. I mean, like, I, I really do think we need to be evidence based in these things, especially if we're going to muck around with something that is, you know, as as important to our society as our constitutional rights. Fair enough. Um, well, so I want to zero in a little bit more on this idea of the algorithms. Right. It's in the title of the presentation. Right. Um, I mean, of course, any algorithm you have, there's people behind it who design the algorithm. Right. I mean, it's doesn't it's not a one to one. Right. Because. If, and I'm not a tech person, I run an online law school, but I mean, I don't understand the algorithms, but I think that's the point, right? They're a black box, is that you don't really understand how they work other than you feed it, you sort of train it some initial information, it goes off and it does its thing, right? Um, at least for, for a lot of these algorithms that, that are going on. Um, 
So we've talked a little bit about the idea of algorithms that decide what you're going to see, what's in your feed, right? And how there's the potential risk of this echo chamber effect where it shows you more and more specialized, some might, might say more and more extreme versions of what you're already viewing, and it tends to polarize society. There's that risk, right? There's the risk of um, filtering out objectionable content. And the question is, does it over filter, right? Does it take out too much legitimate speech with dangerous or otherwise objectionable speech? Then there's also the issue of advertisement and news slash fake news, right? And so, of course, I want to talk about, a little bit about uh, the election, right? And um, Russian bots and all that stuff, right? Because, you know, as a somewhat lay person in this field, when I think of the risks of social media, right? The two things that come to the top of my mind are hate speech and Russia interference in the American election. And Shinmaiyi might have something to say about other elections, right? I'm only somewhat knowledgeable about the American election, right? But isn't that an area of sufficient concern, right? That a foreign uh, entity, arguably an adversary of America, uh, interfered. We could debate how successful it was or whatever, right? But I mean, that they at least have the intent to interfere with our democratic process in ways that people didn't even realize, right? It wasn't like I could say, I choose not to look at white supremacist stuff or I'll, I'll disregard it. That people didn't even know what the provenance of these uh, posts were. Um, how do we deal with that? Is there a way to deal with that that doesn't involve more censorship? Um, yes. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't think it's about the censorship. I mean, none of the, I mean, I, I don't know who you're censoring when these things, I have to think about it, because there's three different things that you talked about. First, in terms of serving stuff on, mm -hmm. you know, through our feeds, you know, Facebook is making that decision. And they're making that decision based on not just the algorithm. I understand that, you know, people talk about algorithms a lot, but an algorithm is just a recipe, right? It's right. not, uh, it's what data, what are they training it with? And what right. are they trying to do with it? Um, the right. Facebook algorithm, uh, you know, as far as we can tell, is trying to keep you on Facebook. That's its goal. Its goal is to have you not leave. Um, because the longer you're on Facebook, the more ads you see, the more ad revenue they can get. Um, and so, you know, that's why I think that the, you know, the observation that I, I find the, the most evidence for is that keeping you outraged keeps you on the platform. And so that's why they keep you outraged. Um, and that's kind of the neurological thing that's going on in that. Uh, we can absolutely decide to not have the algorithm solve for that right? You, you tell the algorithm what you tell the, you know, you use the training data, you use the matching, you use, it's, it's a whole system. I, I, I just, I want to just push, just make sure that, that the listeners understand. Sometimes people talk about algorithms as if it's kind of this evil standalone thing, but it, it's, it's just a, um, it's a, for, for technically sophisticated people, it, it, it strikes them as weird to say, you know, like the problem with this cake is the recipe. And the answer is like, well, no, you got to look at the ingredients. You got to look at how it was baked. You got to look at whether somebody added arsenic, you know, like it's, it's not the, 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 the recipe matters, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of spaces in there to try to put pressure on the companies or limit what they can do, right, in terms of consumer protection around these kinds of things. Um, in terms of the filtering, like, you know, noting what they're, you know, using uh, machine learning techniques to try to spot stuff that could be dangerous and trending, they do a lot of that. They've always done that. This is not new. All the way back, you know, they the, all the companies participate in this thing called NICMIC, which is a way to try to um, catch uh, child porn um, and uh, using, uh, you know, uh, machine learning and matching systems to try to do that. So, you know, they're doing some of this um, and they're continuing to do it, making sure that they do it in a way that's smart is continues to be a challenge, uh, again, because their incentives right now is just take down as much as possible. And that can be very dangerous because people, people can um, manipulate those systems, especially if they're based on community standards, they're based on people's complaints, they're, they can be very easily manipulated to try to, and are often, to try to silence people, you know, who have a political difference from each other rather than things that are purely hate speech. 
Um, and then there's the ad. Sorry, I don't want to manipulate, but there is a, you know, there's the bill, uh, you know, uh, Facebook has just said that they're going to voluntarily start revealing who's purchasing ads up of a certain thing. Um, there's a bill in Congress called the Honest Ads bill that uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar is proposing that would do something similar. And instead, Facebook basically just voluntarily started doing most of what that bill would require on their own. Um, I think more transparency is great. Um, I also think that now that we know that these things can be manipulated, we are all better off and able to be much more skeptical about what we're seeing. Um, it's very interesting to me that the demographic research that's come back about who spreads fake news online and who falls for these advertising skews older kids today are wise to these tricks mm -hmm. and it's their parents and grandparents who are falling for it. Um, that's uh, interesting news, but also kind of good news uh, because it means you should go talk to your parents um, about it, but it also means that the younger generation is, you know, as with most technologies, the younger generation um, is learning how to use it better. Um, I, I do think that every new technology that comes along, the first generation that interacts with it kind of, tends to kind of screw it up. If you look at the history of cars, for instance, and you know, what it was like to drive a car before we really all learned how to do it. Um, I think we're all, you know, kind of Sunday drivers with this technology now. And as time goes on, we're going to get more sophisticated and more able to see these kinds of things, um, which, you know, isn't the only thing we should do, but I think it's important to keep in mind, there's a bit of a moral panic going on right now. You know, it doesn't appear while I don't, I am not at all a fan of what the Russians did in that election. It's not shaking out that it had a significant effect. Now the election was very close. So a small effect can be significant in terms of how things worked out, but um, many, many other factors also contributed to that. And I think that the Russian ad buys um, and efforts that they did to create fake things didn't end up being one of the bigger things that happened uh, in the election. That's good news. It doesn't mean that we don't aren't vigilant, um, but I think Facebook has done a better job in. Uh, later elections to try to catch that kind of stuff uh, before it catches on. I'm not sure they're done yet. Um, and again, I'm no apologist for them, but I think it's important for us to be evidence-based in what we freak out about. Okay. Um, Shanae, uh, thoughts uh, either on the American election or any uh, other elections and how social media uh, and manipulation might be playing a role? I couldn't possibly do a better job with the American election than City has, but I will compare it again to, so I've been watching it with interest because of the way in which it's been playing out around the rest of the world, right? So you describe the manipulation as external. For the rest of us, it's been internal, you know? Yeah. And, and so for me, sometimes the question has been, how big a difference does it make that your democracy was manipulated, but from the inside, not, not by another country? I think that you'll find that the Brazilians have the same concern where mm -hmm. all of the misinformation and disinformation spreading on our platforms are really coming from inside. Um, and, and it's interesting. I don't know what the Brazilians would say about it. And honestly, I don't even know where I would come down uh, in, in the context of India. But colleagues from countries with fragile media, media ecosystems have pointed out that if your mass media is not quite healthy, then where do people look to for the truth? How do you, so even if you know that, that uh, disinformation is spreading on social media, you need something to orient you to the truth. And you basically have nothing in a country that has a weak fourth state, which is many countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, disinformation takes on like a completely different um, sort of role almost. Um, the, the second is that I, I know that I, I've been following the Indian elections closely, as you can imagine. And it's been interesting because the regulators and the companies have been trying to solve for this. They're aware that it's a, it's a serious problem. Uh, but I was looking at the systems that they came up with. And, and the problem is that there's no way in which you can examine these systems and make sure that they are neutral. So the trouble with, with all of these issues is that the issues are real. The problems are um, are, are correctly identified, but I think it doesn't follow that the solutions that are being offered to them are appropriate. And so, uh, for example, if we're discussing taking down of information or blocking of certain accounts, right, there has to be an audit to make sure that it's done evenly for, for all political parties. If that doesn't happen, it will still affect the election, possibly more than if you had left it alone. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I, I think that that the, the fact that that doesn't exist is is an issue. Uh, even in the question of ads, for example, I remember over a year back. Uh, so I'm 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 in Cambridge right now on a visiting fellowship, as as you said. But um, before I left India, someone from the Caravan magazine had reported that they tried running buying an ad for a story that was about the ruling party's president, his his son, and this financial transaction, which, as you can imagine, with an ele- election coming up, is important political news. It got sent. Facebook didn't allow the ad. And I was like, why? And apparently it violated some mortgage policy. But but this is, I mean, this is like exactly the kind of news for which we have freedom of expression protections. Um, and so, so the trouble again with creating all these layers of filters and blocking with no oversight as to how they're being applied is that they end up affecting the election too. Um, and and you know maybe maybe it's not intentional because of, on on part of the platforms and the thing is that who do they go to when they're under pressure? They go to governments and they go to ruling parties and they go to people in power and these are usually not the people that are uh, you know that are there to kind of ensure that the that the elections are um, are independent and free. So yeah, I mean you know we had a we had a great example of this just recently when Elizabeth Warren came out with her, you know, proposal to break up Facebook and then tried to buy a Facebook ad uh, about it and and Facebook blocked it. Now, mm-hmm. I don't think Facebook blocked it because they were intentionally trying to block Elizabeth Warren because they're smarter than that. And, you know, the reason we all know about it is because of the attention for the blocking. But like this is not a random side kind of thing that happens. It's very hard to block speech appropriately, even if you all agree what appropriately means, and in no way, shape, or form does the world agree on what appropriately means. And so, um, you know, that this is, this is, I, I just think it's wishful thinking that we could, you know, like, we all know that X is bad, so why don't you just block X, Facebook? Like, I just think that that, it does not recognize the scale of what's going on, um, but it also doesn't, it really kind of elides the fact that as a as a global society, we don't agree about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate in enough cases to be able to, to make these kinds of worlds. And it switches really fast, right? I mean, you know, uh, most of the people who, uh, many of the people who um, I think we could all agree, you know, the neo-Nazi groups or the white supremacist groups, um, we're uncomfortable with their level of activity. They are extremely flexible in able to change their language and their meaning and their things to try to get around these filters, right? And to try to um, make something as simple as this, you know, Right. So you're really chasing the sunset if you think that somehow Facebook is going to end up with some kind of master list of all the bad people or a master list of all the bad things people say and then able to implement it. If such a master list existed, the technology to implement that is not hard. Um, The problem doesn't come from from the technology's ability to block. The The problem comes from the technology's ability to block well and to match how manipulative and changeable humans are in trying to get their message out. Maybe, well, maybe so. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Martin. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that question. I just want to flag one sort of broader question before we move on. So when this whole thing with all the election disinformation happened, right, my first question was why, why did Facebook start meddling with elections in the first place? Because they did. They were, you know, in our countries saying, we'll talk to the election commission. Voters should engage via Facebook. People should campaign via Facebook. Did they not imagine that this would happen? And I only say it now because I recently saw that they're launching a new thing called Facebook Crush, which will be notifying people. You notify six people, apparently, that you're romantically interested in. And I'm like, what could possibly go wrong, right? (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I think it's really clear that uh, that Facebook should not be in charge of trying to solve this problem. Um, and, you know, one of the most troubling things is now Facebook, you know, Mar- you know, Zuckerberg is now saying, look, we need to be regulated. And, you know, that is on the one hand, OK, good uh, if they really want uh, to do that. But if you you know, we we've been fighting them on a biometric identity bill in in a law in Illinois, they've just tr- they've just managed to kill privacy, uh, good privacy legislation in California. Didn't even make it out of committee. It's not just them; it's all the companies. But you know, they 
they should not be in charge of trying to figure out how to solve these problems. They are not, uh, they're, they're conflicted in, in what to do and they haven't shown very good judgment. Um, we kind of need to understand what they're doing in order to come up with good laws and rules around here. But um, it is, you know, very, it should make everybody a little nervous that Facebook is now, you know, suddenly saying that they want to support regulation of them. So we have uh, actually only about five, a little more than five minutes left. Um, so to try and end maybe on a somewhat optimistic note, um, I want to spend these last few minutes talking about possible solutions, right? Um, the Santa Clara principles are an example of uh, advocating for more transparency, notice, um, more realistic and robust appeal rights. Um, I'm guessing you guys support those, but do those go far enough? What, what are things that you think would work as opposed to just trusting Mark Zuckerberg, right? What things would both work and be realistic to be implemented in light of the existing economic and political environment? Well, EFF helped draft the Santa Clara principles, so uh, um, I would get in trouble with my colleagues if I said otherwise. Yeah. Um, but they are an attempt to be realistic about content moderation at scale and the kinds of things that can begin to give us a foothold in what's going on. They're primarily about transparency and accountability um, and, and making sure that we have a clear picture of what's actually going on inside these companies. And I think that without that clear picture, any attempt to try to come up with a solution will will falter. And so to me, the Santa Clara principles and the transparency that they bring are kind of a fundamental thing that has to happen before we can pick the next thing, um, or at least as part of picking the next thing. Because um, a lot of the things that have been floated as the next thing are, are I think, very counterproductive. Um, uh, I feel very strongly like uh, the immunity of Communications Decency Act Section 230 um, is tremendously important for us to preserve at this moment, not eliminate at this moment, because um, we need platforms for people to have their voices heard, especially marginalized people. Um, I Again, I think that looking about how do we redistribute the web, what are the things that we would need in order to take these powerhouses out of the centrality of hosting our speech um, or make them not as important, so interoperability, affirmative or uh, affirmative and negative side um, and, um, and and really putting pressure on the companies to put the power of, of your experience on these things in your hands right you should be able to manipulate the algorithm about what you what news what you see in the news feed what ads you see you should have a lot more control over these things and you should have a lot better ability to leave if it's not serving you I agree with that. What I would add to it is, uh, at least for as long as they have the power, some sort of affirmative obligation to respect uh, human rights like freedom of expression and privacy around the world. Yes. And towards that, um, Article 19, building on the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, David Kaye's recommendation, they've been discussing the idea of social media councils that would work like press councils around the world and, and look at what platforms are doing. I feel like it's a, it's a good step. It, I, I think it remains to be seen what form it will actually take. So ideally, if I were to regulate, I would regulate for human rights and not give the platforms the option to say, well, you know, this government's fussing a lot. Let's just agree to violate the freedom of expression here. I, you know, that, that affects a lot of people around the world. That's one. Two is um, that, um, I think that having done that, there is a space within which only platforms know what they're doing. And I think that not excluding for, not, not assuming that this will violate human rights, it's helpful to think about Jack Balkin and Jonathan Zittrain's model of information fiduciaries, where they say that like lawyers and doctors, we should regulate to get platforms to act in good faith. So if they know that their actions will cause harm, then it would be their obligation, even without the rest of the world knowing the specifics did not cause harm. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, well, I want to thank both of you for uh, what I found to be a very stimulating conversation. And I know I've tried to push back on you a little bit, but that's part of what these great. questions are for. Um, and uh, to all you in the audience, I know we didn't get to all of your questions. I apologize, but there's just so much to talk about, so little time. Um, so I want to thank you both for joining me. Thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, I hope you've all found this uh, entertaining and informative. Um, these are obviously very important and very complex issues. 
they basically are the convergence of law, policy, technology, sociology, commerce, you name it. Um, these are some of the, the thorniest and most important issues of the day. They're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to wrestle with things for, for decades and beyond. Um, so that's all we have for today. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you at our next speaker webinar. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.